Yes. Yeah, so what I'd like to talk about, you know, we often don't think about this in anthropology, but what do people talk about? Because when you listen to conversations and you record what people talk about, you learn an enormous amount about a society. So today I'd like to do uh, to look at fireside stories among the Junhuasi Bushmen, comparing day and night conversations and the implications for cultural transmission and cognition. Now, wait a minute. Uh, maybe I, I'm just trying to think, maybe I have to move it forward here. Yeah. Okay, so this is a really interesting question. At some time in our evolution, firelight extended the day and greatly altered our circadian rhythms. Um, people began to stay up, sometimes till 10 at night, sometimes till midnight. When fire came in is a big question of debate, but right now it looks like somewhere between 300 and 400,000 years ago. Um, and humans became the shortest sleeper of all primates. Um, okay. The physiological changes to make this happen were great, and the repercussions, um, which I will not discuss. But basically, you had to have genetic change that allowed changes in circadian rhythms and sleep intensity for this to occur. Um, selection pressures were strong. So, and the time that's gained, it's not economically productive time. It is today with artificial light, but it was not in our evolutionary history. So what might have been the pressures for extending the day, changing our circadian rhythms? And when you change the circadian rhythms, you have higher fertility, you're susceptible to many other diseases. So it, it brings on a whole raft of other issues. <laughs> So my question is, you know, was what transpires in conversation by day and by night among the Junhuasi of the Kalahari? And why are these additional hours so important for human sociality, for our ultra sociality, really? And I'm going to try to show that in these stories, in, in this talk, you have the formation of imagined communities or virtual communities um, composed of members widely distributed in space. And I'll talk about in time and space. So it goes back to the ancestors and goes over a huge area. And then um, during these um, night sessions, you have the transmission of cultural institutions, the really big picture, which many people living in a small hunting gathering band just do not see. So um, let's see, this is the way it turns, yeah. So we're going to travel to Northwest Botswana and Northeast Namibia. Um, and how did I come ac across this? Well, it was very interesting. In 1974, heavy rains destroyed the resources in the area. Desert used to drought, but it's not used to such heavy rains. It, um, the grass grew, it, it, it swamped all the tubers and bush foods, the nuts fell off the trees, the games were dispersed, and people were really, really hungry. And I hadn't been out there for so long, but I knew some of the language, and they asked me to drive into town and bring back food to feed them. It was a 14-hour drive on tracks. I had a little Land Rover, and there was no way I could have done that. So I got kind of ostracized and just sat it out. And it was very interesting. I, at that time, um, people began to make things and gifts and talk about things and talk about people they missed. And they sent out some of the young bucks to explore what's in area, other areas. And at the time when hunger really set in, suddenly everyone disappeared. Um, in different directions. So, um, but during this time when I was ostracized, I began to work on conversations. I figured I had to learn the language and I just went around and um, recorded in notes what people were talking about. So that led to this study. Um, so I, I, these are the camps I worked with, seven camps at like Adobe. Um, and that's the composition, not so important. And um, at this time, the Junhuasi were on the cusp of change. They began to hunt on Herrera horses. They had some metal arrows. There was some alcohol available in surrounding communities, small income from the sale of crafts, 
um, Bushmen were settled in Namibia on a South African station, and a few, very few kids went to school. So uh, change was beginning to come. Now I'm going to give a brief introduction to the Jindalasi forges of the Northwest Kalahari. Um, <laughs> and go through the cultural institutions that regulate relations and make behavior predictable. And this has a lot to do with what people talk about. That's why I'm beginning with this. Um, the first one is kinship. They have a basic Eskimo ter terminology at the base. It's modified by a name sharing relationship, which means there are many possible terms. And then the older gen person decides which term to use for the younger. Um, and then you have egalitarian relations for which the Juntasi are so famous. Leadership involves first among equals. There's constant, more joking and leveling. If someone tries to be a big shot, they're put down, but often in, in very amusing ways. But still, the Juntasi can rank people as strong, average, or weak. Um, the equality it avoids dominance or exploitation because it means if you're equal to someone, you can move, you can ask, you could give without fear of domination. And it reduces the cost of mobility. If you go to another group, um, you don't have to work your way into a hierarchy. So that's very important. Food sharing and then um, vegetable foods, small animals were consumed at family hearths. Meat from the large animals was distributed in the famous waves of sharing in the camp and to other camps. There were rules governing sharing um, and sharing promoted harmony and it reduced, of course, the risk of hunger by sharing in the, by storing in the bellies of kin. Um, and then you had arranged marriage and bride service, which is always a big topic of conversation. Very elaborate rites. This puberty rites where the um, pubescent girl is in the hut and the ladies are dancing with bare butts around the hut and the men are looking from afar to see if they can see anything. Um, and um, marriage is used to build far-flung social ties. I mean, I think the average marriage is about 75 between partners who live 75 kilometers apart. Families are supportive. And then there's a long bride service while the girl matures, the young man becomes integrated into the camp, and then they can decide to live where they please. Land tenure, there are definitely defined territories and um, great variation in resources from territory to territory. And many people have rights to a territory, but tenure is obtained by assembling people and occupying the land. There was great concern when I was out there with holding mortis, and it was a reason to assemble larger groups. Um, and But the access to land of others was obtained through harrow exchange. This is a semi-formal exchange system in which Xinhuasi exchange gifts signifying underlying mutual relations of support and access to alternate residences. The average person has 15 to 16 partners living within a radius of a full 200 kilometers. This lovely lady on, up on the upper hand, right hand corner is just decked out in all of her gifts, which indicate um, her social relationships. And she's trying to marry off her grandson. And she wants to show that this is indeed a very well-connected family. And the Junghossi spend about 3.3 months a year residing with partners. So there's a lot of movement and this opens access over a huge area. And this is a very important point for stories later. Then you have trans healing, entire bands um, or um, gr groups of bands work to heal by singing, clapping, dancing. The healers travel to the spirit world, fight with the bad spirits who are trying to take the person away, heal the sick and share preventive medicine. It sometimes is effective and reduces tension, unites the community. Okay, so um, the data that I'm going to use is in 1974 when I was ostracized, 
I have, I don't know what's written here because oh yeah, I have I have a hundred and twelve day conversations and fifty two night conversations um, collected in five camps, um, and these were conversations with five or more adults and which were longer than fifteen to twenty minutes, and I noted the topic, focus, people, setting, time of day all the attributes of this. And then in 2011 to 2013, I thought these things need to be recorded, both you know, for the Jeune children in school to have a record of their stories at night, but also so that we can really analyze them. And I was fortunate that the anthropologist Megan Beasley had trained a team of Jeune to write in their own language and translate. So this team here is working on laptops and they translated the stories that were collected. It's not as easy as it looks, constant problems with viruses, laptops, theft, but somehow we managed. So what do people talk about in the day? Um, So you can see economic, about a third of the day, Complaint and criticism is constant. Another third of the day, a lot of joking, particularly sexual joking, um, land rights, inter-ethnic issues, and stories. Uh, and these daytime stories draw people from a wide range of camps so that um, you do get a lot of interaction in this talk with non-kin, which makes it possible for kin and non-kin to live together. (laughs) And culture is transmitted in two ways, in traits and in packages. And a trait might be the attributes of the arrow or something like that. And a lot of the focus of conversation in the day was on traits, how to do things. And at night, the packages, uh, really descriptions that allow people really to grasp the cultural institutions that um, run the show. So here's a here's a daytime com, um, conversations. The economic, it's things like food, location, who in other areas has food, hunting, hunting on horses, talking about new technology. Alcohol, big subject of interest because it was so recent. Illness, cash, trucks and repairs. Trucks are recent, but they love to discuss them and aero technology. Um, so there were a lot of the date conversation was centering on traits and new introductions. <laughs> Um, And then a third, 34% of the conversations were slander, gossip, (laughs) complaints. So what does it accomplish? Well, unwarranted and fabricated jealousy made up 25% of cases. People just criticizing someone because they were jealous or they were fighting for a man and a woman criticizes another man or vice versa. Feeling hunger or pain and blaming others. A lot of old people, you know, get into this, socked into complaint talk big time just because they're getting old and they're hurting and not much can help them. And then norm violation or genuine disputes, 33 cases, about half were about genuine disputes between people. And um, there's little fact checking. People have their agendas in doing these things, even in the disputes. Um, Often the target of criticism is in the group or within earshot. So he gets the message or she gets the message. And okay, so includes all daytime conversations. Here we go. Wait a sec, I'm just having, I can um, only change here. Yeah. So who is targeted? Individuals in own group, 22% of the time, target one person in own group, 11, target people in other groups. A lot of times it's giving information and targeting other people in other groups and sort of discerning, discerning who one can trust and cannot trust. Interestingly, the camp leaders refrain from criticism in 62% of the cases. They're very careful to try to mediate and not engage in such gossip. 
Um, and the segmented groups target outsiders, and that builds um, unity. Complaints are constant. Vents, they vent, expose, they resolve tensions of the day in and out. Um, they bring about cooperation of kin and non-kin, bond by targeting. And in only really, I would say, 30% of cases, criticism is used for norm control. Um, and the other thing is a good piece of gossip, as in every society, is a gift. So, you know, if people bring gossip, everyone's very eager to hear it. And it serves to work out problems, keeps camps together, important for holding land. A lot that goes on in the day is important. <coughs> then what happens at night? And this is one thing I noticed throughout working there. In the day, people would prey on me all day long to give them things, to do things, to help them with this and criticize me for not being able to give everything they want. At night, as soon as the sun set, that was off bounds and people were joking and laughing and there was just none of this harassment, which was is constant when you work with Vision Plessy. So this, this slide compares, um, let's see, is this, let me just see if I skipped some, I think I skipped something. Wait, just having trouble with that. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Um, so Isaac Dennison wrote, at times I believe that my feet have been set upon a road which I shall go on following, and that slowly the center of gravity of my being will shift over from the world of the day, from the domain of organizing and regulating universal powers, into the world of imagination, with the coming of the dusk, with the lighting of the first star and the first candle. And this is really describes very well, you know, what you feel in the Kalahari. Um, let me see. I'm sorry, this is the, the arrows. But, okay, so this compares day conversation and night conversation. And we just discussed what was in day. And when you look at the night, suddenly everything changes. Myth and stories make up like 85%. Economic complaint, land, interethnic. These rarely come into play, except if there's been a big problem. And then problems of the day can be carried over into the night. But I think in generally, people feel bonded by the darkness. They don't want to start fights. Um, <clears throat> at night when you can't see anything. They'll fight it out during the day, don't, don't want to. And people move into storytelling. And um, I've got here data from 36 nights, four camps, um, and there were eight nights of music and singing, six nights of trance dances, and most evening people gathered for storytelling. Um, and again, you get a number of people coming from different camps, but not as much as in the day. So then at night, the harsher mood of the day mellows. Men and women and children gather around single fires and they talk and they tell stories. <laughs> Sometimes they tell myths, but they weren't doing that so much more in the in the 70s. But the stories tell of their own experience or exploits or those of not present. And it's often done in a very beautiful rhythmic language affirmed by a hey. Um, and the listeners are really stunned by these stories. They, with suspense, they're either rolling in laughter, they're biting their nails, they're close to tear. Tears. But if people come in after a conflict in the day and they hear these story, it puts them on the same emotional base at night. Gradually, people start to laugh or, or express fear or, or cry. And so it, it brings people back in sync. <laughs> Um, who are the storytellers? Men and women, usually older, just partly because they have more experience. Some of the best are blind, interestingly. Um, and they tell con 
telling stories of their own experience, and that way they spread their name and reputation. So if they tell a good story of what they experienced and someone tells that in another camp and another camp, everybody knows something about them for quite a radius. Um, the listeners benefit from information and knowledge gained. The stories are packed with social information. Not much environmental information, which surprised me. Few moral messages. You know, people uh, people don't hit each other up with moral messages in the Jinghuasi. The, the morals are sort of assumed. And myths play with the rules of cultural logic. Uh, so eventually, the day, then you have economic technology, nitty gritty of social relations. And night, you have stories about imagined communities that are not physically coherent in time and space. And these stories give the big picture of how institutions work. And the cultural transmission transmits mostly packages. Like, for instance, and I'll give some examples of this. They also stimulate a higher order theory of mind. So they get people to think about what other people were thinking and what they were thinking about other people. So this expands both empathy and understanding how people felt in different times. And it, it really challenges people to think what others were thinking about others. Let's see, which is a very human characteristic. Um, and this is, I, I'm just going to go through this quickly, but basically you can see that during the day, just look at the day and night columns. Um, things like equality, kinship, good, dues, marriage, meat sharing, land rights, things that have possible conflict are discussed in the day. And um, things that do not have so much conflict are discussed at night. And so what I did is I took mention of all the people in stories, um, the stories that I collected, and people in these far-flung networks, they really brought right to the hearth at night because the descriptions of them are so accurate. And as Jung Hwasi say, a story doesn't have to be true, but it has to ring true. It has to catch the attributes of everybody. Um, and so, and they describe in these broader configurations of social networks. This is the location of protagonist and story um, told by people in four different bands at Kaikai. So you can see here that um, the, the farthest arrow that goes south, that's about 220, 230 kilometers. Sahitwa, the one on the right, is about 200. So you can see that through these stories, people learn about people over a vast area beyond their own camps. And these are friends and these are kin, so they begin to have a sense of a virtual network as well as people who live together in space on a regular basis. So um, marriage is a very interesting one because the marriage ceremony in the, among the Jinghuasi is very complex, but it's small gatherings It involve, and um, maybe two camps. In the lifetime, some people may only experience two or three marriages. And, but the stories transmit the full details of the ceremony. And so young people are prepared by learning the anxiety of their parents, the procedures, what to expect, and so on. And these are some young girls here approaching mar marriageable age. They, they often marry very young. So here's a story of a marriage that um, told by an old woman, Kuka. Um, they struggled with me, carried me piggyback, and put me down at the marriage hut. Then people smeared us with elan fat and red earth and smeared us. They put beads on me and bedecked me with yellow bark cord ornaments. Then they dispersed, and I went home, and I asked my peers to take those things off of me. They removed them and put them in a heap to the side. My mother said, Kulka, don't do this. I gave you the man who hunts, so don't do that. <laughs> That's what my mother said. Then we stayed around and stayed around and later and later they caught me again and let me have it. My mother took a little whip of this size, small stick, 
and came and hit me saying, Kuka, stop doing this. This is the man I gave you. Your father gave to you. So you must marry him. So this, you know, transmits to younger people in a, in a society where there were arranged marriages. It transmits um, information about the marriage. And also in the story, every stage of the marriage is described. <laughs> Another example I'll give you to of how these stories get people to see the big picture. There was a seasonal gathering around the Marshall's time of six bands in the 50s in the Morena Bean season. And the stories coming from this gathering, and this goes on, I must have 30 pages on this. They not only tell of certain procedures, but of relationships, of kinship relationships. Um, so let's see, I have to just move this annoying thing. Okay. So this would be just a small excerpt on a seasonal gathering. She got the other skin apron and shared it with my late grandmother and took out another skin apron and gave it to her aunt, the late Lisa. Mwah. Then she gave out more gifts. It was the beginning of gift giving. He, Kashe, tried to put the beaded headband on his head, but it didn't fit. So he took it off his head and gave it to my granny and gave other things to her. In turn, my grandmother took out ostrich egg cell necklaces and gave them to grandfather of the late Kai who then passed it on to a younger relative. He gave an ostrich egg bead shell network to her. Komagusi was the one who bought it. Although young men, such as his late son, Kuka, was the one who actually carried it. So when you look at this, you see what they're doing is they're extending the knowledge of kin um, kinship relations. People don't teach kinship like we collect genealogies. But through these stories, people come to learn who's related to whom and how. Who is now at Kobaha. People always brought these things to him and his kin. His father, Da Gonga from Duda, was the one who gave out these gifts and ornaments. His hunting bag and quiver was always full, and he bought many things because he was rich. Very, 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 very rich. Young men from his place worked for him. So you can see how these stories transmit information about institutions, relationships, and um, the, the attributes of people. <laughs> Okay, now let's see. Uh, okay. Sorry, I'm just having trouble with these. Uh, yeah, windows. <laughs> so, what goes on in it? Does this go on in other hunter gatherer societies? So, I went through the human relation area files, and there were 38 mentions of sanctioning gossip. None of these was at night, interestingly. Economic plans were largely discussed by day. The nighttime for the imaginary, just among the like among the jeunes classy. For 60 hunter-gatherer societies, mention of song, dance, healing, and ceremonies at night, as well as stories. In the far north, sometimes the stories in the winter extended for two to four days when people were sitting around these huge fires. Um, night stories are told in all hunter-gatherer societies and they transmit the big picture of social institutions and ethics, whether via folk tales, myths, or dreams, an analysis of dreams. Um, oops. Oh. Okay, so then just to sum up, so night stories are told in all hunter-gatherer societies and most, most small-scale societies. They are the original social media, together with gifts that indicate um, relationships. Uh, they give positive reputations to skilled narrators. And people listen because they get valuable information from them. Um, they give information on character traits, feeling of others. I've already discussed this, transmit how institutions work, relieve tensions, and they really expand the imagination. They really play with this. So they take the listeners into the world of imaginary 
the imaginary and they maintain networks. Very often when you sit, hear someone telling a story of someone who lives far away, if it's a really good story, the next day or after a few days, you say, I want to go visit someone so-and-so. So it is a stimulus to um, um, move around and visit outside the group. Now, we appear to have evolved, whoops, <laughs> that's an interesting spelling of evolved, an appetite for stories. I mean, when you think about it, we have novels, we have films. Storytelling is almost a must for kids when they go to bed. It's used in teaching. Many people on wilderness tri trips sit around the campfire, tell stories. It's used today a lot in therapy. It's used in restorative justice. <laughs> And we still have, you know, a very strong attraction to firelight. I mean, Danish hygge has got a lot of attention lately, but the Danes tend to put flowers, all, uh, candles all over their flats and light things up, particularly during the dark days, candles and fireplaces. So I think, you know, it's, it's interesting. Many of these um, desires are carried over until today. <laughs> All right. Now, so we I'm just stopping here and then I'm doing a section on change if you want to hear it or we can stop here. But here are my thanks. What do you want to do? Well, we, we have time to continue. Yeah. Shall I continue? Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Please yeah. do. So this is change. This is not last year, but the year before, people <laughs> riding in the back of my car. And you can see that things have changed a lot. Um, Jun Lossi are now settled in permanent villages. There's an enormous amount of poverty and hunger, as you can see in the left-hand picture. The dogs get the worst of it. There's more time for day talk because people are not hunting and gathering so much. And some of them live in pretty awful conditions. Some are moving into the Namibian middle class and buying vehicles and leaving their former lives behind. These are few, but I'm currently studying these and the dynamics and how the inequalities develop and what people say about them also, which is very interesting. The internet has come to remote areas of Botswana. Tlaikzai is like, you know, six hours off of any main road, but they still have an internet station. And just to the right of that, the donkeys come and water at the well. Uh, trophy hunting brings cash income. And this is an elephant killed by German hunters. And the Bushmen are very, very skillfully and delicately um, cutting it up and it will be distributed among the Jinghwasi villages. <laughs> Cash crops, people go into the veld, they live like they used to, and they harvest these crops oh, at a great physical effort and very little money. Uh, you have mission activity that discourages transhealing and traditional beliefs. There's a Romanian mission in there, which is very, very aggressive. Um, and tourism, unfortunately, is making a commodity, a commodity, that's a good <laughs> misspelling, of Xinhua culture. Um, this is a young man addressed to perform a trance dance. The problem with the tourism is that it becomes a commodity and people no longer want to sing at night, trance dance, or do any of their traditional stuff because they should be paid to do it. So once it becomes commoditized, it tends to disappear. Cell phones, this is traditional beadwork holding a, a Nokia. Um, cell phones um, totally are beginning to change patterns of communication and interaction. So what's happened to night activities with all of this? This is really interesting. Um, stories are still told largely about current events, but not only, and new developments. This old guy, um, um, uh, um, he's been blind since I first met him in 1973, but he picks 
up on everything. And here he's telling a story describing seductive Bushman girls in these short skirts and makeup and everything who have become prostitutes in town. And he gets every movement of them right, even though he's never seen a thing. Um, and yeah, I've already mentioned that, the commoditization. Uh, <laughs> So what happens at night? Um, we, what, because we have such a rapidly growing population, um, the youths have their own cohorts for night activity. They often they get, often get a boombox, and then they go and they dance, and they have their own fire. And they don't, you know, they used to sit around with their parents in the laps of their parents, snuggled around the fire and listened to the stories that transmitted culture. Now, it, the transmission of traditional culture is greatly reduced by, um, you know, the separation of elders and youths in night activities. And, um, of course, modern stuff is coming in very fast in these, these youth groups, understanding of that, but um, tradition is being lost. And then you have... Now these large cell phones that draw the attention of the entire village. I was going to record stories and um, a trans dance one night and everything was organized and someone comes in um, with a huge cell phone with a karate film and that just drew off everybody because the Bushmen don't permit much violence and are fascinated by it. So porn and violence are introducing a lot of new, new ideas at night, which is the only time usually you can get a signal is at night. So what next? We don't know. Here are two old sisters <laughs> who lived a very traditional way of life. And then here's a modern family. So what next? I will only see. Thank you. Should I stop share? Yeah. yeah. So thank you very much, Polly. It's an incredible story, but you've been able to observe all these changes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have uh, some questions for you. Um, you know, your video is not working. Can you My video? Us? Oh, here, no, it will start again. Wait a minute. Yeah. Is yeah. that good? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah we, we, have, we have some quick questions for you um, in the audience. Um, listening to what people talk about, uh, is there also information available in attending to what we do not talk about? Sorry, could you repeat that one more time? Uh, so is there any information available uh, about what people do not talk about? Oh, Oh, um, yes, it's a really interesting question. People, people do not talk about any details. They don't talk a lot about details of their body and their self and how they look because they don't have mirrors. They don't see each other. They don't talk about any details of private things like sex. You know, they don't discuss that. Um, and but then they talk about most things. Yeah. But there's very little sort of self-absorbed talk, like, you know, what I look like and what, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, can you expand on the idea that storytelling involved more rhythm, rhythm, where some sunk and clapped, like gain of storytelling among uh, Bayaka? So about some rhythmic uh, element of the storytelling. So about the rhythmic element? Yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. And in, in when um, it's very rhythmic in that someone tells it with great pantomime, some of the best pantomime in the world. And then others, when he's done something, others will say, eh, hey. But often, that's why I can't do the translations. The language is highly symbolic. And it's challenging also, it's intellectually challenging um, and rhythmic. And when people go to visit another camp and they're hard up on resources and they're going to go visit their harrow partner, they camp outside the other camp and they nobody comes for about four hours. And then 
people from the camp come out and sit with them. And they have this rhythmic exchange where they exchange all the news from their area back and forth, back and forth with a hey, and then it goes on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the next one is, um, I understand uh, that your, uh, that was not uh, uh, the point of your analysis, but as a developmental scientist, I'm very curious about any analysis that you may have done involving children and would be grateful if you could talk about that. And, uh, that yeah, uh, analysis of what? I'm sorry. Uh, of uh, children, of talk. Uh, that, uh, children, can, you know. Can conversation with kids. I tried to do that, but... I didn't find that it was possible to record. You really have to have people around a fire, you know, where you can get one person who's talking. The kids are just running and screaming and leaping around. And like in many traditional societies, parents don't talk to their kids. They don't sit down and say, how was your day? Or what do you think about this? So I tried to get it, but it was so fragmented that I couldn't get much. Yeah, that's actually uh, in, in this same question, there is a continuation that this group of researchers, they collected audio recordings as children wore a recording device from uh, 5 p.m. to 9 in the morning. But we found mostly sil silence in, in them. So people <laughs> were trying to record that. <laughs> it, it's a very, very interesting question. And of course, in that time, you know, I only had a huge tape recorder. I, I, I didn't have all these modern devices, but it, it would be interesting. But, oh, my gosh, the kids just tear around the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> um, there is a question about that marriage story that you had. Did it have a happy ending? Wait, which one? Uh, the, the marriage story. About the, the marriage story. Oh, yeah. yes, she was married and she was happy. She, you know, she was young and she rejected her husband again and again. And it turned out he was a wonderful guy. And the, the, the men are usually 10 years older and it's very hard to get a wife. So they're very tolerant. And in the end, they ended up in a, as most Bushmen, in a very faithful, loving relationship. But she was a tough one. She had her long period of rebellion. <laughs> <laughs> and if it doesn't, and if they don't, if they really reject someone, then they'll try to marry them to someone else later. The rejection often comes because they're just too young. Um. Is there a difference in uh, truthfulness of day and night stories? Um, this, the day stories are not really stories. It's conversation about the truck that came by or the arrow or where the food is. So it's an entirely different kind of thing. The night stories... As ours, if we have guests from out of town and we sit around the fire, they are not factually true. They're often exaggerated, but they ring true. They absolutely describe the person perfectly and the situation and the feeling. <laughs> so, um, there, there are definitely details to embellish. Mm -hmm. um. I, I know that it's not the main point of your presentation, but your comment about uh, the fire control and reduced length of sleep is quite interesting. Can you yeah. comment on this or perhaps mention some literature about this association um, in advance? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I can't just spin off the literature because I don't have my references here, but if someone emails me, I will send that. An interesting thing that we're doing now with the light and, you know, firelight has certain blue light, other forms of light, which, and, and the Bushmen sit around it and slowly the fire dies at night. And then when it's just down to the embers and there's no more light, if people are not talking and stoke it up, they go to sleep. And I think I'm about to get, it's a little bit off topic, but a very interesting opportunity in Papua New Guinea, where I also work, that, you know, people live way out in the country and they only might have one kerosene lamp for the whole house and their fires. And now, and the government is putting in some tin roofs and solar panels. So we are actually going to, I think, do a study maybe for a month or two on physiological attributes, social attributes, 
of these people before they get electricity and then the effect of artificial light. Thank you. Um, when the conversations were recorded, were people self-conscious and did that change uh, what topics we talk about and how we talk about these topics? People, didn't, people don't even notice that I'm re recording on the whole, unless in, in, in the end I recorded some stories and, and yeah, these were good storytellers, so they were very proud to have the stories told. But the ones I, I got in the 70s, I didn't actually tape record them, I just took notes. And so people didn't know what I was doing, I was just doing my strange thing. And so I, I don't think it changed anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And often I would cook for a whole bunch of people and then just <laughs> pretend to be cooking and then getting the stories while I was cooking. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Uh, this is so interesting. Thank you. It's curious to me how Prime TV in our own culture mimics the same patterns that you demonstrate, uh, fiction at night, news in the day. <laughs> Yeah. But with uh, stream, uh, streaming media, we see people seeking out stories throughout the day. It would be interesting to hear if you think there are parallels to be drawn here. And if so, what uh, the time displacement of stories may signify or change? Well, there are two, two, two interesting um, points here. First of all, I think our real craving for stories, it, we definitely have a cognitive orientation to seek out and listen to stories. Why? Because throughout our evolution, we got very valuable information from them. And so we are selected to listen to them and not, not just go away. Um, that What's been shown very interesting, there's been, and I, as I say, I don't have my papers here, but very interesting literature on this in that novels and stories definitely cultivate empathy. So people who read more novels and such things tend to have much higher levels of empathy than those who don't. So, um, you know, I think that's a parallel. They did, in the Bushmen, they cultivate understanding of others. And in our society, though removed, still they cultivate or they challenge our brains to understand others. Yeah, the removal, I mean, I think the, the only thing that I think is very different with us is unfortunately with the Xinhuasi, they're all together, you know, their bodies are together, they're clustered around, they're laughing, they're interacting. And um, what is interesting is what uninhibits people, I believe, is when you sit at a fire, people tend to stare into the fire. And so the storyteller doesn't feel distracted by, by nonverbal behavior of people. They're just sitting there mesmerized. In the daytime, when you say something, you see the reaction of everyone around you. You don't see that at night. So you get much less inhibited. Mm -hmm. Talk. Thanks. Um, how is sexuality regulated? Are we monogamous? Are women free to choose as in several egalitarian societies? Is there a short-term mating like one night, night stand? I'm asking because of violence regulation. This is something absolutely fascinating. Um, the Xinhua CR probably have the lowest rates of extramarital affairs of most population known without any rules. And Henry Harpending, the geneticist, looked at this and he found, you know, there were only like 5% of cases where it didn't seem like the father was the biological father. And today, even if men get a job and they get quite rich and they have an infertile wife, they still remain faithful. They, it's just astounding. Now, a little bit more with porn and everything, a little bit more of extramarital affairs is coming in, transport, phones. But in the past, it, they were amazingly monogamous. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, that was very interesting. Do you have some answers to your initial question? Uh, that is, why our species is giving up sleeping time uh, to hear stories? Yes, I think that's the answer. I think the answer is that the social information that's transferred, uh, transmitted, the information on institutions, the information about other people, 
because, you know, people live in groups and these hunter gatherers are very dependent on being able to move into other groups to get when their resources are short. So um, if they have knowledge about these people, it, it, it moves. So I think in developing theory of mind, of empathy, cultural transmission of whole institutions. In the day, other things goes on, but in entire cultural institutions, I think those are the selection pressures, you know, that really made us able to form networks and um, really virtual communities. Yeah. Thank you. Um, there is a continuation of a question um, about day and night stories. I'm still unsure what, about why information gained at night would be more useful. Uh, is the fact that the information is disconnected from any real economic social situation? Um, well, it looks the, the, the ending of this sentence is missing, but perhaps you can comment why stories that are not linked okay. to real economic. No. I would never say that the night ones are more useful, but I would say they're more useful for social purposes. So that in the day, there's a lot of talk about food and, and where it is and where you can find things and technology. And then who gave what to whom and didn't share with whom. This goes on and, and, and frictions come out in the day. That is very important. At night, it's just an entirely different kind of information that's transferred, which is information about other people, other places, networks, human situations. And really, sometimes people are just there laughing till they're just rolling on the ground or crying. It also gets people in the day. There's a lot of, a lot of conflict, minor conflict. And in the night, these stories unify and they get them emotionally in tune. Mm -hmm. So they're both important in different ways. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Polly. Uh, we have several panelists here, speakers in this series. I wonder if uh, we have any questions. If you do, just show your, your face, please. Um, uh, Lou, Lou, you want to ask the question? Hi. Yes. Um, thanks for that really fascinating talk, Polly. One other thing I was wondering is if you could just clarify... <laughs> You say like you're you're talking about institutions and then you have folk tales. So is it the case that you have a sort of separation of any kind between how things are, just like stories of what has happened, and then sort of normative stories, like stories about how people should behave and that you're kind of modeling right, correct behavior as well as just explaining what these institutions are? Okay. Yeah. The one is about real the one that I was studying was about real people and real things. Megan Beasley have, has worked with the myth. And and that transmits information about the institutions and so on. The myth and the traditional stories are really pretty wild. I'll just give you an idea. For instance, young men who have to work for their fathers-in-law are really pressured to bring in the, in the meat. And in this myth, the young man goes out and he just hunts and hunts and can't find anything. So he cuts off his own genitals and roasts them and feeds them to people. You know, so all the myth and everything, it just turns out, it doesn't transmit morals. It just, it just shows people doing everything that breaks every moral. And that entertains, right. but it also kind of highlights them. Yeah. But, you know, people well, didn't tell myth, myth much when I was working. It already had died out, so I'm not right. an expert. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you yeah. very much. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, what impact does a uh, historic predator impact have on the use of fire? How long does it take to change behavior with the removal of this pressure, you think? So, wait, so how long does it take... Uh, to change behavior with the removal of the predator uh, impact because of the, of the use of fire. So you mean back in our evolution? I guess, yes. Yeah, I mean, we, we don't really know. We think that, you know, um, uh, the ability to, to build fire and make fire did a lot of things. We think it had a lot to do with um, the development of language because, you know, people would be gathering at night and many other purposes. 
but we don't know how long it takes to turn to change circadian rhythms. That would be some pretty heavy genetic selection, I believe. So I, I, I don't know. Okay, and, uh, and this was the last question for, for you, Polly. If people did not converse during the day, would the conversation change at night? If they didn't converse during the day, would it change at night? I think it would be very hard to shut up people during the day. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's a, people people talk the whole day long. So I think that's unimaginable. <laughs> <laughs> But maybe it would. Today it's changing the nature of conversation because there's so many new things coming in that at night when people sit around, they are talking about new things in trucks and fixing trucks and, and development programs. So it's moving away from this more traditional system that really backed up the network system. And it's being adapted to the new world, but you still get stories where you could just die laughing. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you very much, Polly. Okay, well, thank you. I can talk and thank you to everybody for your participation. Mm -hmm. We hope to Thanks see you. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Polly. Okay, to everybody. off to class. Okay, bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.